So, uh, Bob, this has been super, super amazing uh, because, you know, being able to connect with someone who's living in the folklore legendary days of the beginning of the vineyard. Uh, we were talking earlier before we hit pull, uh, record yeah. that um, my observation is, you know, growing up in the vineyard, I've seen us go through seasons or phases or distractions, mm -hmm. depending on who you talk to. And um, so when people talk about Classic Vineyard, uh, Eddie has that book, right? Classic Vineyard, it's a great right. book. Um, but it's interesting because when you think about what Classic Vineyard is, there seems to be an assumption on the part of the person who is asking if it's Classic Vineyard, if it's like the type of vineyard they went to mm -hmm. and they were a part of. So if you came in the early 80s, uh, Vineyard was one thing. Came in the mid 80s, it was another thing. Yeah. Came in the early 90s, it was one thing. Mid 90s, one thing. And then, you know, now we're 40 years old and um, now we're diverse enough to where I think you probably have. At one time, I wrote down the types of vineyards and I had like, I had like 13 or something like that. You know, I was just trying to like, maybe there's more now. Now you also have Global Vineyard, which we're going to have to record another one of these in the future because we need to talk about vineyard missions at some point in time. But now you've got nearly 2,500 vineyards all over the world who have been shaped by the theology and practices of the kingdom of God. And they all have their own um, encultured way of worshiping. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a vineyard in Kenya is way different than a vineyard in Southern California. It and should, it should be. should be. And it should be, yeah. Um, but when you think about what the vineyard is, um, what what keeps us all together? You know, like, what is it that that makes vineyard vineyard like what's our core identity what's our what's our thing what's classic vineyard according to bob bolton well classic vineyard is one thing it's about the kingdoms in conflict mm. clash of the kingdoms kingdom of satan kingdom of god okay so uh, i think one way or another people stumble over uh, those things and it gets their attention. Mm, okay. So um, is that why you have different, um, I don't know what the best way, different focuses maybe would be a good way to put it in the vineyard. You have some people who are really passionate about signs and wonders mm -hmm. um, because those are evidences for the inbreaking of the kingdom. Right. And then you have other people who are focused on uh, um, friendship evangelism because when people come to faith is an inbreaking of the kingdom. You have uh, just different different focuses, and all those different things are activities of the kingdom. And so is that what keeps us together? Yeah, I, I think one of the things that we tried to do at the beginning, John came with it, there's a mathematical um, uh, theory of attraction and repulsion. Mm -hmm. And so uh, John realized that in the church, uh, uh, well, he, anyway, this has to do with what is called a bounded set. Yeah. Uh, center, center set, set and fuzzy set. Yeah. And we decided we're not fuzzy and bounded sucks. Pardon? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like just as an experience. Well, see, the level. reason is the, the more things you're convinced that people have to believe, yeah, in and out, the quicker they bounce off. Yeah. Okay. And so we decided to have a few core values. Mm. Not that others weren't important, but mm. we weren't going to emphasize them. Yeah. And so that's one of the things that draws people that are different mm -hmm. and they can still be part of us. And uh, just who John was. And, I, and uh, uh, he, he made this statement when the vineyard started getting, becoming a little different. <clears throat> and people start, would say, well, I don't believe what John believes. Mm -hmm. John said, that's fine, which is weird. Most... Yeah, most of, leaders are like movements. You're you, out. You're, yeah, you have to be. You have to sign this document. Yes. Check these five things. And you have to pee in this corner. Yeah. Right? And you, <laughs> you have to never ever <laughs> say different. Yeah. Yeah. And so John said this: You can if, if you uh, believe something, I will, I'll ask you questions theological from the Bible. Mm -hmm. Why you believe what you do, and then tell me where in history the church has been beneficial to the church, and you can teach it. Mm. So he had a way of discerning whether something was helpful theologically and practically, right. essentially. But the biggest thing is, just don't teach against me. Mm. You can believe different than I do, just don't teach against me or teach against each other. Yeah. 
So we so pl- is that where the we, whole we play nice can't comes into the what? The, because there's all these these. Uh, this is again vineyard uh, Wimberism folklore that Wimber would say things like play nice. Yeah. Like just don't be a jerk to each other. That's it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the, don't do a seven part series about why the vineyard up the road is wrong and on I mean, their way to perdition. Right. <laughs> okay. And I'm gonna I'm gonna cancel that then. I won't that, I won't yeah, do that yeah, one. Yeah. So anyway, but yeah. So I just think it was because of uh, who the Holy Spirit was in John. It wasn't just John. The Holy Spirit was in John. <clears throat> that uh, uh, there, the Holy Spirit honors tradition more so than we do. And so that was put into the vineyard. Mm, that's great. That's great. So, you know, we've, we've kind of talked about your history, a little bit about John Wimber, the golfer. I'm going to start calling John Wimber not the church planner or the vineyard pastor guy. I'm going to say he's the golfer. Okay? The golfer. But, I'm gonna. This is my new thing. Uh, going forward, um, you and I, you and I connected uh, initially because we have these mutual friends in New Zealand who we just love to death. They're don't, don't blame them on me. I tried. <laughs> I tried. <laughs> They're the best. I tried. <laughs> uh, and, but when we when we talked on the phone, I guess uh, it was so long ago now because of the stay at home order that everything that was just like two or three months ago feels like it was nine years ago. Granted. Um, so I, I, but we talked a lot about discipleship Mm -hmm. and what God is doing right now, you know, because I think, you know, in the Pentecostal circles you hear, you can't get by on manna from yesterday, right? You've heard that before. And I probably, everybody says that, but uh, where, you know, where do you sense the Holy Spirit leading the vineyard movement in the future? Not just your local church and local churches, but like, What's he inviting us into, and what is what's God doing in relation to discipleship? Share your heart a little bit on that, because when you talked to me a little bit, I just felt like this growing. Um, I, I was talking to Dave Dave King, who's in this room but won't be on the camera with us. Please don't. Yeah, he's yeah. like, <laughs> don't put him on. Uh, we were talking about John uh, John Wesley when he had his uh, Holy Spirit moment. As a British guy, he said he was strangely warmed. Mm-hmm. His heart was strangely warmed. And when you were talking about discipleship and kind of what the Spirit's doing right now, my heart was strangely warmed. You talk about discipleship. You talk about small groups or kinship groups or whatever anybody's calling them now. Tell us what's going, what's going on and what's the future look like and how can we make more disciples who make disciples who make disciples who make disciples. Let me digress just a bit. Uh, when John was at Fuller, uh, one of the things that, uh, that he was impacted by was the house church movement. And he started studying that and actually started thinking about the vineyard being that at, at that time. And uh, Bill <clears throat> Ferris, does Bill Ferris know this? Because he probably would love that. <laughs> yeah, I know Bill Ferris. Anyway, uh, so uh, when we started our, our church, we, we, because we... St- uh, we started a small group in a house and grew up to a hundred and some people. John came, turned it into a church. <clears throat> so, uh, but uh, the, the things that we did in that group, that previous group, was real important to John. So, uh, <clears throat> everybody knows the, the vineyard. We, our first Sunday, we had 120 people. Okay. Four years later, we had 3,000. <clears throat> Oh, that's it? Just 3,000? Just 3,000. Oh, man, I would have had a panic attack as a pastor. I would have just... Wow. Why did we have 3,000 people? Part of it was because of John's uh, focus Mm -hmm. on the kingdom and evangelism. Uh, But the other thing is that I had to start 146 small groups in three years. Do you think about that? These were the initial kinship groups, right? These were the kinship groups. Yeah. Those kinship groups, the leaders were called pastors. Mm. We saw them. Now these tur- now these weren't small. <clears throat> they would run, uh, like like Blaine Cook and I. Our groups would run 60, 70, 80. Yeah, these were these were small uh, churches. Micro churches, maybe, yeah. would be one of, the, one of the ways that you would describe it. But no matter what the size, if it was 15, 20, we still considered those guys pastors yeah. of that. <clears throat> and our meeting on Sunday was a gathering of the churches, mm. and uh, but over a period that was a that so that was a, a philosophical yes. thing that was public, yes. Like it was John Wimber and the early Vineyard leaders, Bob Fulton. That was the way you guys did it. They were pastors. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. 
<clears throat> now, what happened was because we got famous so soon, we blew right past that mm. uh, as a church <clears throat> locally, but then because of our impact in the nations. And so uh, we didn't really get to work that out. Yeah. Okay. Well, so, so, no, that was our history. So it never went down that road of maybe figuring out what the discipleship groups could have could okay. have become. Yeah, yeah. So our our church community um, that we that my wife and I pastor at, uh, we didn't have that type of growth, but we grew by over a thousand percent within like three months. Mm -hmm. You know, thirty five people, yeah. three hundred and fifty <clears throat> people, and I remember it was like every week it was a new. It was like, oh my gosh, mm -hmm. what are we going to do now for discipleship? So mm -hmm. I can I. Not to that extent, but I can really feel the, the challenge of trying to figure out how you're going to do discipleship because I think we both would agree Sunday morning alone is not going to help you mature into a radical, fully surrendered follower of Jesus who mm -hmm. is doing the stuff um, unless you are going to live to 150. Yes. And you're going to be that at, at age 147, <laughs> you know. Um, finally arrive. Yeah, you finally arrive and then you die. <clears throat> So it, it seems like those discipleship groups, um, but, but why is it though that when I talk to, I mean, I've met a lot of those people that are part of that 3000 group and they were radical, you know, they, mm -hmm. to this day, you know, that's one of Glenn the Glenn was one of them. Glenn Schroeder. Yeah. Glenn, mm -hmm. you have these people who were like committed to, I mean, so God was doing something in the emphasis in, amongst your 3000. So the gathering of the churches. John is still teaching about the kingdom of God. He's still teaching about sharing your faith. He's still talking about praying for the sick. He's still teaching about sharing words of prophecy. So those are values. And how and for women to keep their skirts down and guys to keep their zippers up. Yeah, I've heard that too. Real practical. Holiness. Real practical <laughs> yeah, stuff, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, you just would lay it out yeah. there, right? Um, so, uh, you know, discipleship. Help me with this. What, in your, for Bob Fulton, what, what, how do you define discipleship? Well, discipleship would be uh, a person who is focused on continuing the mission of Jesus. Okay. It, it's about Jesus. It's not church. Mm -hmm. See, we, <clears throat> when people are talking about church, they think they're talking about Jesus, but they're not talking about Jesus. Mm -hmm. So for us, you know, and John, he was a big Jesus lover. Yeah. And Carol and Penny and I. And so it was all about Jesus. And so... Um, the, uh, uh, the 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 people that that uh, that we brought up they they were Bible study people in a sense. At the same time, it was about doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because you never divorced knowing and doing, and, and I would say being. Like now, being. when we think about so spiritual yeah. formation, right? It's knowing, being, doing, yeah. having all three of those that triad. Right. Um, you know, so you, you've all, that was ingrained in our, that's why I think, you know, the vineyard seemed to have always been cool with, you know, the spiritual formation, mm -hmm. just, uh, folks, you know, Richard Foster's and Dallas Willard's. Uh, and then we, we love, um, I mean, there's an emphasis on social justice, biblical social justice, yeah. doing, feeding the poor. I mean, Wimber is said to have said, uh, don't put the vineyard name on it if it doesn't serve the poor. And there was always this um, commitment to theology there too. Like mm -hmm. the, er, Wimber was not an anti-intellectual. He actually valued theologians who were helping the church be uh, thoughtful and know how to read the Bible and, and do, but do the stuff though. Well, John was thoughtful. Yeah. yeah. If you went into his office, <clears throat> at least uh, when we moved into Vineyard Anaheim on, <clears throat> on La Palma, uh, if he had these cubicles, these uh, three by three cubicles along this wall, and if he got an, if he read an article on justice or something, he'd throw it in, mm. in that cubicle. Or if it was about evangelism, or if it was about um, living righteously, or for you know disciplines or whatever, he would just throw articles and stuff in there, and he would get them out periodically and go over them. Mm. The one that he didn't get to before he died was justice. And then okay. Just, he, yeah. He, uh, um, but that was in his head. And that, but is it not safe to say that that's kind of what we have the responsibility? We bear the responsibility in the vineyard, you know, for the second, third, fourth generation folks to like pick up that because he used to say, "Take the best and go." Right. Yeah. Like it's now our opportunity to explore the, where wherever the kingdom of God takes us and and where it compels us. Um, 
So let's do that. Let's end with this. Okay. The future of the vineyard. What? Give me the play by play. What? What are we? What's? What's God inviting us to? And um, and maybe not just the vineyard because there's a lot of folks watching well, this, listening to this, who are, yeah. you know. And I always want to say like the vineyard's just. Uh, I joined Wimber and saying it's one vegetable in the stew, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. We're not the best. And we're John not the believes that. Yeah, yeah, and I and I totally believe that. So. Yeah. yeah. And I know you do too. I do too. Yeah, yeah. So tell me, like, what's God doing in the future? You think? What do you see, see happening? Well, um, again, <clears throat> the the principles. If you look at them, whether you call them the genetic code, our values, our priorities, or whatever, they're just they're Bible. Yeah. <clears throat> and the Quakers had them, and Pentecost, other people, Catholics, whatever. So uh, the, the vineyard is just uh, uh, has been a, a group of people that were just trying to live out what the Bible says, and so in order to do that, uh, disciple making has to be the priority. Uh, it's uh, it's the Hebrews thirteen uh, chapter chapter thirteen verses seven and eight where it says that remember those who led you, who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the way they live. Imitate their faith. Disciple making is all about imitation. Because mm. then it goes on to say, yeah. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So it was all about Jesus. Mm-hmm. So it's imitating, like Paul said, imitate me as I imitate, I imitate Christ. But imitate me. And, this, and people say, well, I, I, I can't do that. And I said, what's wrong with you? Mm. You're not imitatable. Mm-hmm. You're not, I don't want you to get a big head. Yeah. But... It has to do, and this is where we were with, with all the Glenn Schroeder and all the kids coming in. We wanted them to, wherever they go, to, to be imitators of Jesus and have, to imi- have people imitate them. Mm. So here's how you handle money. Here's how you handle anger. Here's how you handle, you, you, did, you, did this, you just did this to people. Mm. Remember those who led you who spoke the word of God to you, no matter what it was. Yeah. And so, <clears throat> um, so what I had to do, with imitation. And so that was sort of uh, uh, part and parcel of uh, uh, the, the, the intensity mm-hmm. in the vineyard, the passion in the vineyard. And, and John was a passionate man. Yeah, he wasn't playing games. He wasn't playing games. Yeah. He's he, a passionate he, man. I mean, when you talked about. He would make mistakes, but he'd make them passionately. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you talk about the clash of the kingdoms. He, that was a, because uh, when I, in a previous uh, Wednesdays with Wimber uh, episode I did, I talked about how um, the di- some, one of the differences between power evangelism and power healing is power evangelism really establishes this worldview of, of the conflict, the clash of the kingdoms, and that was a framework for him. So like he saw the inbreaking of the kingdom as push, not just coming and, hey, I'm here, but pushing back the kingdom of darkness and, and coming in conflict with it. Um, so there was a passionate commitment to continuing the ministry of Jesus, mm-hmm. of making disciples who make disciples who make disciples who make disciples and keep on going. And now we're 40 years down the road, um, you know, and, and you've been able to see that. So what's it like? Uh, what's it like being great? Are you great, great grandpa to some of these disciples or? Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, like, how do you? How do Carl Tuttle and yeah. all those guys. How do you feel about that? Well, uh, you know, people never do everything you'd want them to or become everything you want them to become. <laughs> Typical grandpa. Is that, is that a little news? disappointed. Is, is that, that what you're saying? To you? Is that news to you? But, but the point is this. You love them all. Yeah. Mm. Uh, and, and, and people get to take what, whatever you give them, and, uh, and they get to do whatever they want, and you love them all. Yeah. Gotcha. Because... Uh, I've never lived up to everything I wanted to be, neither to John, neither Carol, or Penny. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we didn't expect everybody to live live at the whole thing. Okay. So. I and I, I and I think and I think in the vineyard, this is why people can appreciate people from different cultures, uh, different paradigms of thinking or whatever, and uh, as long as it exalted Christ. Mm-hmm. And it and it, it brings people, you know, into an awareness of what they can become. Yeah, which is all about the kingdom. Mm. Bob, 
thank you so much for uh, taking the time to you know share your heart, share some of the some of the history. And so you know, for those who have been watching or listening to this podcast, um, you know, it really is a gift because um, for those of us who weren't there. There's so many questions and, and things like that, you know. So let me, let me ask you one last question. I know I've already said we're getting, but if you were to, um, to maybe, you know, explain um, the kingdom of God to someone who's like, I don't understand why you keep talking about the kingdom. You vineyard people talk about the kingdom. You followers of Jesus talk about the kingdom all the time. What is the kingdom? Well, the kingdom is what Jesus came to emphasize. You all know the Mark 1 text. And uh, so it, <clears throat> it, it had to do with, with Jesus bringing the, the ministry of the kingdom in a new way. Mm. And it had to do with him connecting with the Holy Spirit. I don't know why, but it seemed like a lot of people missed that. Uh, because John the Baptist was told by God that when you go out and baptize him, look for the one on whom you see the Spirit resting mm. and abiding. Mm -hmm. He's the one who's going to baptize in the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And so the kingdom was all about, uh, Old Testament-wise, uh, it wasn't just Joel, it was also in, uh, by Moses uh, in, uh, in, Exod in Deuteronomy 11, or, excuse me, Numbers 11, uh, but it had to do uh, so with the spirit that's on you being passed on to other people. And so when uh, John was told this, uh, he wasn't told that the one on whom you see the spirit, the one, he's the one that's going to save the world from their sins. He's going to baptize in the Holy Spirit. Well, the, the kingdom of God has to do with the baptism of the spirit, the presence and power of the spirit of God. Mm. That's great. Um, there's, uh, in fact, for those of you, um, you know, click the description for this podcast or this YouTube um, video, and there's going to be a link to some books in there too, because there's some really great books that connect um, pneumatology, you know, the study of the Holy Spirit to the theology of the kingdom. And there's no way you can really dive into the theology and the practices of the kingdom without having a uh, more robust commitment to saying, come Holy Spirit. Yes. Yeah. Thanks again so much, okay. Rob. Thank you. Thank you.